Critical Software, The Need for a Radical Solution, a 68-minute presentation held in the Lando Lecture Theatre at the Defence Academy, Shrivenham, on the 12th of March 2008. The speaker is Martin Thomas. We're not building software the way that we ought to build it, and that's because we're not buying software the way that we ought to buy it. And I spend an awful lot of time that I'd rather be spending in my, in my workshop or on the golf course fighting these battles to try to, just to get a, an industry that is now undertaking problems that are more complex than anything that mankind has ever attempted in the past. We're, we're building systems of a higher level of complexity than engineers have ever built before. And we're doing it using tools that are frankly only fit for hobbyists to be using in in their kitchens. We're facing engineering challenges and and we're doing it using, at best, craft technology and at worst, hobbyist kits. And and as a consequence, things things go wrong. This is sort of problems that that we, we get. Firstly, the project's overrun. These are the latest available figures from, from Standish, which has been monitoring this stuff in America for, for a decade and more. Big overruns, much worse on big projects than small ones, and you will, of course, typically be involved with big projects. And computer system failures are costing, well, they're costing billions of pounds in the UK on average every year. We've got things like the National Health Service IT system going badly wrong at the moment, for example. That's a project that started off at £2.4 billion and is currently estimated at somewhere around £12.5 billion if you, if you count the software that's centrally budgeted for, maybe £30 billion if you look at the overall total costs. And it's far from clear that it's actually going to deliver anything that matches what the National Health Service really needs. Lots of projects get cancelled. And, and those that... Those that get into service tend, tend not to deliver the goods either, and 70% of functionality is about typical. But worse than that, quite a lot of them fail in, in safety-related ways, or in particular in security-related ways, which is a, a particularly big problem and growing problem at the moment. So why, why do they overrun, firstly? Let's, let's tackle that. Uh, usually it uh, starts with a requirements problem. The, the business needs aren't properly understood, and so you get a lot of late changes, and that causes delays. And when you look at the changes that occur on most projects, they're not things that have changed in the world since the contracts were let. They're things that were perfectly well known to someone before the project started, but which somehow never found their way into the requirements and consequently turn out to be a contract change. And the industry, the supply industry, knows this perfectly well. They know that it's going to happen, and they bet against you that it's going to happen. And so it's fairly routine for the supply industry to calculate its bid price on the basis of what will win the contract, completely independently of what it will actually cost to build the system, knowing that they can get their margins back on the contract changes. And they then will put staff full-time onto managing change. Their job is to make as much money as they possibly can out of the contract changes that that will flow from the fact that you as the customer has not done your job properly in drawing up a a sensible set of requirements at the beginning. We have to change that, otherwise any other way of uh, of improving the the state of the industry just fails. While, While people can still make their money out of playing that game, there isn't a motivation to to turn into a proper engineering discipline. The other big trap people fall into is stakeholder conflicts. Different people wanted different things. Somebody was going to have to make a hard decision. They were going to have to tell a minister they couldn't have what they, what they wanted or um, they were going to have to face down some general and say that his, his particular pet desires aren't going to be in this project because it conflicts with something else. And they're not prepared to do it. So they fudge it. They, they write a, a set of requirements that sort of blur the issue. And in doing that, they push the problem into the project, at which point, of course, it resurfaces. And then instead of the person who fudged the issue at the beginning being sacked, the person, the, the poor fool who took on managing the project after the contract ends up with, uh, with egg all over their face. So it, it is important to draw up 
requirements that really have got rid of all these ambiguities and blurrings and have got an appropriate level of detail for the job. I audited Bowman. Uh, I was part of a team from Kinetic, a Malvern-based team, back in the 1990s, 1997, something like that. And at that time, I mean, it's changed radically since then. This is, this is not telling you anything about what it's like now, but, and I don't know what it's like now. But back then, it was seen as a pure systems integration project. There was nobody in Archer Communications who were the people developing the system who had any claim to understand software and software assurance and you know, how, to, how to do software integration and software acceptance because it was just an integration of existing COTS components. Uh, when we looked at the project, we found a million lines of new code were being written and they didn't know. And they didn't know what they were going to do about it or how they were going to, to handle it. And the requirements had changed. It started off as a, a pure... Uh, communications medium and then it turned into the infrastructure for the electronic battlefield with applications like fire control uh, running over it and yet when we looked at the spec it didn't guarantee message delivery so you'd got guys on the front line with with your own shells falling on you wanting them to stop firing them please and the underlying communications mechanism that was being built for the future wasn't going to guarantee that that message would get through to the gunners that seemed to us not very smart. These are ma management issues. Of course they're management issues. They really shouldn't happen. They're not, they're not technical problems, but they are the kind of things that, that cause systems to get delayed massively and cause operational difficulties. Just a, a quick aside, because I'm, I'm going to start talking about specifications, and, and I just wanted to introduce some, some terminology I would be, be using a project starts off with a need, and that is always informal. You know, for example, a trivial, trivial example, you, you want a, an odometer for a car, you know, a, a trip counter for a, for a car dashboard. And so you, you have a need, which is, is always expressed in, in an informal English language form, and then you turn it into a requirement. Typically, in big organizations, it's a list of shalls. The system shall do this, the system shall not do that. It's still in English, typically. And then you have a, a development process that flows from that, and you have a software specification that's drawn up, and high-level designs, and test specifications, and detailed designs, and, and finally you get down to, to code, and you end up building the modules. That's, that's the sort of, of flow that inevitably happens. Whatever process model you're following for developing software. These phases are gone through in some order and they have those sort of relationships. Now, almost all software is developed using informal methods. To a first approximation, all software except the most secure software is developed in that sort of way. So your, your need statement is in English. The requirements are then drawn up in a form of, of English, perhaps supplemented with some, some pictures of screenshots, some diagrams of message flows, things like that. The design is, is then typically diagrams, maybe you know, partly structured diagrams, maybe just boxes and arrows with English labels attached to them. Lots more English. Um, maybe some of the algorithms are actually sketched out using a, a some form of programming notation, a, a, a pseudocode to, uh, to try to explain what it is. But it's all informal. And then the project gets coded from that design, usually in a, a language C, C++, which is not a well-defined language. It is entirely legitimate for the meaning of a C program to change when you recompile it, irrespective of whether you've changed the code. The compiler writer is completely entitled to change the order of evaluation of expressions, and that may completely alter the, you know, depending on the, the program you've written, it may completely alter the way that the, uh, the program functions. In particular, that's likely to happen when you change some other part of the software. So you change one part and the meaning of some, something somewhere else changes. There are bits of the language that are defined as being undefined. So what they say is, essentially, don't do that but the structure of the language is such that if you do do that, by accident perhaps, 
There's no way that the compiler can tell you you've done it. None of your tools will tell you you've done it. You've been trapped into making a mistake that will be hard to find later on. You've, you've written a, a program, the meaning of which is undefined, and you can't tell you've done it. So the languages that are typically used are really not fit for purpose. We, we know the underlying computer science that is needed to strengthen the languages, and languages like Ada, for example, incorporate that computer science, but they are not widely used for a variety of largely social reasons. Then you get tests. The development process is essentially test and fix. If you wanted to characterize it in a phrase, that's, that's what's going on. It's come up with a set of code, test it and test it and test it and fix the bugs until either the, uh, the delivery date arrives and you decide that you're going to list all the, the known bugs as features and ship it, or you get to the point where you think that you're not finding very many errors anymore and so it's probably all right, so you ship it. And academic research has shown that typically... Following that process means that you deliver into service after the final user acceptance tests code that has between 6 and 30 defects in every 1,000 lines of code. So if you're, if you're shipping a million lines of code, you've got somewhere between 6,000 and 30,000 faults still in it after it's finished testing. The 6,000 end is if you're doing something as rigorous as following the IBM cleanroom process. And that's pretty rigorous. Typical industrial software development will deliver somewhere between 10 and 20, depending on what you regard as a, as a defect. And I'll, I'll come back to that and show you some, some defects that have been through some very rigorous development in, in, a, in a little while. The alternative is, is that you go down this column and you use formal methods, as they're called, where you, you do what every other engineer does and rely on the rigor of mathematics to enable you to say things unambiguously in a way that you can then get tools to analyze on your behalf and tell you where you've said that things that are inconsistent. And that's what every other engineer does. You, you build a bridge, what happens? You do a, a structural analysis of that bridge, you do a finite element analysis, you express the thing in terms of mathematical relationships that, that record the stresses, and you run an analysis on it to find out whether everything is in fact within tolerance. We can do that in software. Software is an inherently formal medium. By the time you have actually got down to the binary running in the computer, what you've got is a mathematical notation. It, it happens to be a particularly intractable mathematical notation to analyze, so it's not a good place to start trying to, to understand what it does. But nevertheless, the meaning of that software is completely unambiguous by the time it's down in, in binary. But the important thing is that if you're going to end up with something that is going to be formal at the end of the day, you, you can get huge advantages out of formalizing it as early as possible because then you can reason about its behavior all the way through. And so a formal approach starts with informal specification. The needs, of course, level is, is informal. The early draft of the specification will, will be informal. But then gradually you strengthen the English by saying again what the English says using mathematically strong notations. And there are lots of them around. There's a very commonly used one called VDM, the Vienna Development Method, another one called Z, and a development of Z that is, uh, is quite widely used now called B, and, and its latest development called Event B. VDM was used on the air traffic control system that Praxis built for, for, for Rob, or for, for Nats. B has been used extensively on the uh, Paris Metro, for example, and Siemens use it very widely for metro systems. The, all the signaling and control mechanisms for a lot of European metro systems are, in fact, um, designed and developed in, in B. Uh, Z is currently being used for a, a suite of safety-critical air traffic control tools that are being built for NATS at the moment to handle the, the very high densities of, of airspace that are forecast for the future. So you use these very rigorous engineering notations for, for your requirements, and the developers take responsibility for the correspondence between the formal notation and the English description. 
And they, they keep rewriting the English description as the formal notation causes them to refine it, to restructure it. Typically, you end up with a smaller, simpler statement of requirements in English than you would have started with because the formal analysis has, has enabled you to get a much better, clearer structure of exactly what those requirements are. And then you carry that formality through the design. You take very, very small steps from the specification into the design, making very small design decisions as you go, and each time checking that the properties that you've asserted about this overall specification are maintained in the design. And it sounds laborious, and it sounds as though it's going to cost an arm and a leg, and as I will show you later on, it doesn't, and it isn't. And then you code in a language like Ada, which has a, a strong definition, which provides very strong data structuring capabilities. So you can build big, complex data structures to really match the real-world data objects that you're, you're trying to manipulate. And the language structure and its tools, the compilers, guarantee that you're using those data structures in the ways in which you've said is, is legal. So you... You can't write one, one structure of one shape into an area that, is, that you have said is a different shape or is a different sort of data. It means that you can define that this particular location is only going to hold numbers between 1 and 15. If you have a, a number that indicates which engine on an aircraft you're currently talking to, and it's a four-engined aircraft, you can guarantee that you can never refer to engine number zero or engine number five because you've <coughs> defined that as a range of one to four, and it is just impossible to write the number five in there. The compiler will immediately flag up the fact that this is an illegal operation. So lots of the sort of errors that you might make in a, a weakly typed language simply get caught immediately you make them in, uh, in a strong language. Then you do, do testing, of course, but you also do proof because now you've got uh, a definition of exactly what the software is supposed to do and you've got the code that you've written that is supposed to do it and they are both mathematically formal and so you can show that one matches the other. And that's something which requires a lot of proof steps, thousands, tens of thousands of proof steps almost all of which, 97, 98% of which, will be done automatically for you by the theorem prover that comes as part of the tool set. So you only get to focus on the things that, that the theorem prover can't just blow away for you. And typically, those are areas of the software where you really do need to think quite hard about, you know, is this something that I believe? Is this really what I wanted? Have I expressed it quite right? And by doing the process and doing some restructuring, you, you get out the, the last 3%. And you've got a mathematical assurance now that the software really does do what, what you said it ought to do at the beginning. And if you do that, you end up with systems that are less than one fault per thousand lines of code. The systems that I've seen recently have been 0 0.1, 0 0.01 faults detected in the first few years of service per thousand lines of code. So you really can get a, an enormous improvement in the quality of the software and, and in the likelihood of safety or security errors. And you can guarantee certain properties. I mean, for example, going down the formal methods route, you can guarantee that there will be no runtime errors. You can guarantee that there won't be any of the buffer overflow vulnerabilities that are, are typical of the way that hackers e exploit software in order to, to break the security because those properties have been proved, those, those defects have been proved not to exist in your, in your software, so they, they just can't be there. And the reason why software projects overrun then, in software terms, are that in general there isn't a formal specification. So you, there isn't any rigorous analysis for emissions and contradictions, and the requirements errors are found late and that causes delays. That gives you a weak basis for verifying the design, so the design errors get found very late as well, typically in testing, by which time you've got a lot of rework to do when you've, you discover the design doesn't work. Uh, it gives you a very weak basis for designing your tests. So quite often there is a, a, a disagreement between the people writing the tests and the people writing the programs as to what the specification meant. So you end up with a system that fails the tests, 
And then you get into an argument about whether nevertheless the program does in fact conform to the specification. And that's typically now an argument between the customer and the developer as to who's going to pay for the changes. Because if it's a spec change, you pay for it. And if it's a a, a development fault, then the developer pays for it. So these, these arguments go on and on, and they're very drawn out. And if you're arguing around the meaning of English words, and then you get lawyers involved, you can see how the costs go up and the project overruns and things get very messy. And, of course, you're likely, in any case, with an informal specification, that the whole thing was ambiguous. And so there will have been misunderstandings and need for rework and so on. If you want to write a formal specification of the halting problem, you know, the, uh, the, the standard um, um, computer science example of a program that reads in another program and its data and tells you whether that program run on that data will ever terminate, that is known to be non-computable. You can show very straightforwardly that, that you can't write a program that can, can do that for all possible programs and all possible data. But you can specify it perfectly well in a, in a formal language. But at some point in the development, it will become apparent to you that actually that, that is, is a non-computable problem. And you'll pick it up quite early on because you've made it so explicit what you're doing that, that the people you're using who are engineers who understand computer science will say, oh, that's an example of a halting problem. We better fix it. Much more commonly, what you get is, is um, uh, problems that, that are uh, typically a, a traveling salesman problem. You know, the, the classic problem of working out the optimum route for a traveling salesman who's, who's got to visit lots of different locations, which is known to be an extremely hard computational problem. It's, it's, it's NP hard. In other words, you can't produce an algorithm to solve it, which in the general case you can match uh, against a a, a polynomial time. You can't can't come up. The time increases exponentially as the number of nodes go up. That's that's the the essential issue with with a traveling salesman problem. And if you express things in these sort of formal notations, you can spot that kind of problem in the underlying calculations you're trying to do quite easily because it's perfectly clear what you're doing. My heuristic for doing design was always do the bits you don't understand first. The sort of easy way to find out which bits you don't understand is the next step that you carry out should be the one that you really, really, really want to put off. So, you know, look at all the tasks and the one that you least want to do is the one that you need to get on with because you can almost guarantee that that's where the difficulties are going to arise and and that's why you don't want to do it. It's a nasty discipline because it means you're constantly doing all the stuff you don't want to do. But but nevertheless, it it does prove to to work out in in the end. So it will show up. It it will show up. And and actually, these are are theoretical problems that don't really bite you. I mean, you know, people say, how can you you reason about completeness and correctness when we've got the girdle uncertainty? You know, the Gödel's theorem about, about the, the inconsistency of any form of, of mathematics. Yes, but in practice, it's not an issue. So it's, it's an interesting thing for scientists to talk about. It's not of relevance to engineers in general. The more structured you can make the early stages, um, the quicker you're going to, to get to a point where, where you've really crystallized what it is you're talking about and you can then start the process of formalizing it and making sure you really do understand it. I've been working with the, the National Academy of Sciences in, in the US on a study that they've been running on how to develop dependable software. And we, last October, presented that study to the sponsoring organizations, which were um, the Office of Naval Research, the... Uh, Federal Aviation Administration, National Security Agency, the um, U.S. Army, one or two others who'd actually paid, paid for the study. And to my astonishment, although we had been careful not to explicitly argue for formal methods, but to argue for scientifically sound evidence all the way through, um, all those organizations in asking questions, started from the assumption that we had in fact been telling them that what they needed to do was to use formal methods. And all of them started on the basis that that was what they were planning to do 
and now let's talk about how we're going to do it. So I, I felt a, an astonishing change in the way that, that the big um, American spending agencies were, were planning to, to move in the future. Um, I'm, I'm a bit alarmed by it because I think their expectations are too high. In particular, we were arguing in that report for simplicity, that, that there were some systems that were just too complex to build dependably, whatever methods you tried to use, and that the only solution there was either to simplify them or not to build them or to give up on the dependability goals. And we got a lot of pushback on that. They didn't like that message. Okay, I can understand why they didn't like the message. It's true, so they're going to have to live with it, but um, they'll, they'll find that out in due course. little aside about testing. Almost all of the analysis that, that happens on software is testing, and almost all of the way in which people develop computer-based systems relies on the intuitions that people, engineers, developers have had from past experience in building mechanical systems. And so people assume that you can do reliability analyses that are analogous to dealing with the reliability of hardware. But hardware wears out. Hardware components fail, not for design reasons, but for physical reasons. Valves jam. Diodes stop working because they get too hot and they actually physically break down. You don't get those sort of problems with software. Software problems are design problems. The software does what it was written to do, but it turns out not to be what you wanted. And it will always do that if you can reproduce exactly the circumstances that, that triggered the failure. Now, that may be arbitrarily difficult in a concurrent system where lots of things are happening in parallel and interacting. It may be very difficult to set up the conditions for failure again. So you may get what looks like intermittent random failures. But they are nevertheless design failures with the software doing what it has been written to do. And the behavior of software systems is made up of billions and billions of independent, largely independent states, where the system, all the, the system data is in just, you know, subtly different, different states from every other state. And there are, in, in even a relatively small piece of software, thousands, millions, and billions sometimes of different paths that the, the control flow can follow through the software. We've done an analysis of you know, a 100-line module and found in real software 750,000 paths that, that could legitimately be, be taken through a, a piece of code uh, of only 100 lines. And real commercial software being deployed is much bigger than that. Windows is, is 100 million lines of, of code. Oracle talk about having a gigalock, you know, a billion lines of code in their code base. Uh, SAP, at a meeting I was at a month ago, claimed to have 1,000 billion lines of software, although, uh, frankly, I don't <coughs> think that the world has existed for long enough to write 1,000 billion lines of, of software. So I, I, think, I think that may be a, an exaggeration, but... Think how many paths there are, how many states, how many combinations of paths and data there are in those big systems. You certainly can't test all of them. The software won't exercise most of those paths and states in its entire operational lifetime, let alone during testing. And the worst thing is that with physical systems, if you, if you test a, a balance for you know, 10 grams and 100 grams and a kilogram, you know from the physical laws that it will measure correctly in between. If you test a computer system, even a computer-controlled balance for a few spot points, it tells you nothing at all about the behavior in between. You can make guesses that the behavior of the software is probably continuous, but it, it would be trivial to write a piece of software that didn't behave properly for the values in between, and that could easily happen by accident. So testing tells you that the tests work. That's usually not very interesting. If you want to know that the software works, you need to find another way of finding out about the software. And that means analysis. And this false intuition about software is at the heart of, of a lot of the problems that we face in doing software assurance and, and achieving dependable software. People assume that when something doesn't work, it means we didn't test it enough. 
But if you say to them, well, how long would have been enough? They don't have an answer. But it, it makes no sense to say, we didn't test it enough, if the answer to how long would have been enough turns out to be half a million years. People claim that, you know, avionics in aircraft, they claim a probability of failure of 10 to the minus 9 per hour. One failure in a billion hours. If you wanted to show statistically that you had achieved that to 99% confidence, you'd have to test for about 10 billion hours. Now, there's 10,000 hours in a year, so you've got 10 to the 5 years, 100,000 years of testing in order to be able to show that you've achieved a 10 to the minus 9 per hour failure rate probability. Do you think they've done that? Do you think they've done within three orders of magnitude, five orders of magnitude of that? Probably not. What it means is that the, the claims that are currently made about the reliability of software have no scientific foundation. The safety cases that are put forward for, for, the, the, for safety critical systems in all sorts of industries have no scientific foundation. And it's shocking, but it's true. It's very fashionable these days to talk about and use agile methods. People say, don't, don't write a specification. Start off by writing a few tests and write some software that passes the tests and then show it to the customer and discuss with them what they really want and write some more tests for some more functionality and, and enhance the software and keep building real bits of software and passing more and more tests and evolve towards the, the final product. That's great for prototyping. Super for, for building systems where you really don't know what the requirements are and you want to find out. It's also good for systems where you're perfectly happy to put the prototype into the field. If, you're, if you want rapid development of a website and you're not really quite sure what the website should do and it doesn't matter to you if it crashes or um, gives out the wrong information in the early days or every now and again in, in real service because it's not critical then this is a great way to do it, and it works fine. It's hopeless if what you're trying to do is to build a well-engineered product reliably that's <coughs> complex and where you've got some strong dependability requirements because it doesn't generate any evidence. A system is only dependable if you have justification for trusting it to behave the way that you want. And you can't justify trusting software unless you've got evidence. And that evidence can only come from the kind of analysis work that, that I've been talking about. You can't get adequate evidence just through testing, as we've just discussed. So agile methods are fine in their place, but their place is relatively limited. If what you're doing is building a prototype and then you're going to re-engineer the final product, that's fine, because the, the prototype's just helping you get the requirements right and the specification right. If you're using a formal approach then you can do incremental development and, and frequent builds and essentially follow a lot of the Agile model. But the bit that you can't afford to, to do out of the Agile model is, is not having the specification because you'll need to take architectural decisions, high-level design decisions that have far-reaching effects on, on the product. And if you get those wrong then the final product won't be able to have the properties that you need, however hard you try. And going back and changing architectural decisions is by definition uh, expensive and, and costly in terms of time as well as, uh, as money. So whilst you can do step-by-step -step development, and, and I would strongly advocate it for, for, um, for systems, even when you're, you're using formal methods, you really do need to make sure that the things that you are confident about, about what the product needs to be, are in the specification right from the beginning. Because that reduces your development risks dramatically. If you leave out of that first specification stuff that actually you knew uh, was going to be a constraint, then you've robbed the developers of avoiding making the mistake of violating that constraint. I was an expert witness on a, on a big billing system for a major utility company. They had a, a customer information system and billing system for a big electricity and, and water and gas supply, and they needed to replace it. They put out a, an output-based specification, and, and on that basis selected a, a supplier and a package that the supplier already had, and came up with a project duration of, of about 15 months and a, and a budget. 
And then they got into the detailed gap analysis between what the package provided in, in real detail and what the news that users knew that they needed in real detail. And they found all sorts of constraints that they hadn't put into the output-based specification. Statutory requirements that, that um, people on life support machines mustn't have their electricity cut off and that therefore that affects the whole way in which you flag people on the database and handle the, the management of delinquent accounts when people aren't paying. Um, special tariffs that are available to people with particular disabilities which in combination blows up the number of different charging regimes up into thousands of different potential tariffs that people could be on. Uh, problems where the, the registered address of the meters that you're reading is not the registered address of the customer that you're billing and where you may have um, multiple meters mapping onto an individual customer or even, strangely, occasionally, multiple customers mapping onto individual meters. These were issues that were inherent in their business and which they, the staff who were running their current billing system knew all about but weren't in the specification. As a consequence, the, the detailed uh, requirements analysis took a year and the timescales went out by 18 months for, for delivery. And they couldn't, as it happens, slip the delivery because their old system was not year 2000 compliant and therefore they had to get it out of service. Uh, they planned to have a complete year of, of running on the new system before 2000 they in fact put the new system into service in October 1999, having decided to stop doing the testing because they needed to get it into service. And as a consequence, the cutover period, which was scheduled for a weekend, took six weeks because they found lots of errors during the cutover. They hadn't done the data cleaning properly either, as it turned out. And the flood, I mean, it billed people the wrong amounts of money. It, uh, it, it didn't produce reports in the right format. They couldn't balance the company accounts properly for, for several months. The um, number of people complaining about their bills swamped the call center um, to the point where a majority of calls weren't getting answered and so people would hang up and ring in again. Or So people stopped paying their bills. The company ran out of money. They had to be bailed out by the state government. And six months later, none of the board of directors who had let that who had been in, in control of the company when the contract was let, were in post. That was a cock-up, in my judgment, as a result of, of an output-based specification that simply did not convey the true constraints. Uh, it was compounded by a number of other incorrect decisions on the way, but that was where the, the root of the problem. Even when you get, get a, uh, the project through to delivering a system, the system itself is, is often not not dependable. You, you get security vulnerabilities, you get safety critical faults, you get requirements errors, you get programming errors. Here's, here's an example of a requirements problem. Uh, this was an A320 that ran off the end of the runway in, in, in Warsaw in 1993. Aircraft landed on a, on a wet runway in aquaplane, so the brakes didn't work. Or at least they, uh, they didn't stop the aircraft or even slow it down. Pilot applied reverse thrust to stop the aircraft, but it was disabled. Why was it disabled? Well, it's disabled when you're in the air, for obvious reasons. It's pretty catastrophic if you deploy reverse thrust when you're, when you're flying. And the requirements was that airborne implies disabled. There was a, a hidden assumption that a good surrogate for whether you were airborne was whether you were getting pulses from the wheels rotating. But the wheels were locked. The plane was aquaplaning and the wheels were locked by the brakes. They weren't going around at all. And so it looked as though the plane was airborne and so the reverse thrust was disabled and the pilot didn't have any way of stopping the aircraft. Now that's a, a, a grossly oversimplified analysis of a complex accident and Peter Ladkin has done a detailed study of it from the accident reports which, which you can find on, uh, online if you go Googling for it. But um, it, it, it is the sort of issue that, that needs to be drawn out if you're... Real requirements exist in, out in the world. They, they're not things that are on the interface of a computer system. They're, they're, not, they're not things that, that are local. You know, you're not interested in what sensors and actuators do. What you're interested in is what the aircraft does. And so it is important to make explicit 
the assumptions that you're making about the way the real world is behaving in order that you can then reason about the requirements that that imposes on, on the software and, and the rest of the systems. You can't build safety critical systems safely if you don't understand the environment they're going to be operating in. Um, people tell you all sorts of things that have hidden assumptions that everybody in the industry understands. You know, when I say X, it's really just, just a shorthand for this great nest of complexity that we all know about. Um, and if you're not really familiar with the field, you, you don't see that complexity and it bites you later on. So you need people who are experts in the application domain. You need people who understand about aircraft and landing gear and what it's like to fly a plane involved in the, in, in the specification of the project. Now, where are you going to find them? Some of those will be customer experts. Some of them will be supplier experts, um, including your, your architect team, your people who are, who are actually the experts drawing up the specification for the, for the developers to work to. Uh, and it's that team that has to, to take responsibility for this. And ultimately, it has to be one person on the customer side and one person on the, on the architect side who, who are actually accountable for it. And, you know, as, as with any engineering project, it has to come down to, a, to an individual who's taking overarching responsibility. Part of their responsibility then is to gather the right expertise around them as part of their team. This is a bit of, bit of code that came out of, a, a, of an aircraft that was actually flying. It's a, just a, a bit of program that, that takes in a, a three-valued input. It could be a warning, it could be a caution, it could be an, an advisory. And what it's supposed to do is to, to give an alarm to the pilot if the event that's come up is flagged as a warning or, or a caution, but not to put up an alert if it's merely an advisory. So it rings an alarm bell if, uh, if it gets a... Uh, a warning or a caution, but not, not for an advisory. But when you actually look at the code, it tests for whether it's a warning, and if it's not, it tests for whether it's an advisory, and then it returns a result without ever doing anything at all if it's a caution. And so the result that's returned is completely undefined in that circumstance. It ought to be true, and it depends just entirely on what data it happens to have picked up off the stack. The important thing about that is you're not likely to find it by testing because you could run this lots and lots and lots of times and the, un the um, uninitialized data that gets picked up could give you the correct result. In fact, in this particular case, because of the, the way that the software was laid out, it did give the correct result every time they tested it. But nevertheless, it, it's a, a bug that was lurking there because it was only given the right result by chance. And at any time, either as a result of a different sequence of operations or as a result of a change in the program somewhere else, this was going to blow up and catch them. I worked on a, a big air traffic control system in, in Australia, again as an expert witness, and the, the developers had, in the early stages of, of uh, bidding for this contract, had demonstrated the, the fact that their air traffic control product had a whole range of facilities that were, that were required. They'd, they'd brought users in and done demonstrations and, and so on. And on that basis, they had asserted that the product was you know, sort of 90% complete. Uh, when I actually got to look at the code and the state of the project and how it had developed on other projects over the years, uh, it was clear that it was nowhere near 90% complete. I can't remember whether the figure was actually 90%, but it was nowhere near as complete as they, they had claimed for it. It's very easy to give the wrong impression through demonstrations. I mean, this is a, um, a, a classic. This is, is Van Kempelen's Mechanical Turk that played chess back in, in the 1700s um, and was, you know, toured the world beating, beating people playing chess. In fact, it, it had a little man hidden behind the works in there who was doing the chess, and it was a clever bit of, uh, of mechanics that, that actually enabled this Turk to make, make the correct moves and win the chess matches uh, despite the fact that it had a, had a man tucked away inside. Uh, I've actually, they, I, I saw an exhibition in uh, Budapest where they've got a museum to this guy and they've actually got the original there and it, it's a superb piece of, uh, of, of mechanics. But it was a complete fraud. And I just wanted to say, don't 
don't trust your eyes, basically. You know, suppliers will, um, will do their best to present things in the, in the best possible light, and demonstrations don't, don't really tell you a lot about, about systems. Certainly for, for COPS products, this is, this is standard. You know, the customers are the beta testers. Too many faults, call them features, ship it. Future developments... As usual, um, Scott Adams gets it right. I mean, Dilbert, Dilbert tells the truth about the software industry once a day. It's, uh, it's scary stuff. Here's some safety critical faults that were found in uh, some code. In some code for that aeroplane. That's the uh, Hercules C-130J. These, these errors were found in code that was flying, that was certified that had been through the strictest avionics standard, DO 178B. Some of the code had been through the level A of that standard, which requires a, an extremely rigorous test regime called MCDC, which I won't bother to go into, but it's, it requires much more than testing every path in the, every, every, li- every statement in the code. It requires testing every branch in every direction. It, it requires testing every condition within every branch in every possible direction. The analysis of the code that was carried out at Boscombe Down found no discernible difference in the fault densities that remained in the code, depending on whether it had been through level A with this stringent MCDC testing or level B without. And the densities they found varied from um, one defect in every 250 lines of code at best which was um, Spark ADA code, down to one defect in every five lines of code at worst, which was for some particularly bad modules in C. And these are the sorts of errors. You know, data not sent, erroneous signal deactivation, undefined arrays, stale values, display of misleading data, safety checks not, system not not closing down, um, all, all sorts of incorrect direction data you know, the system runs backwards all sorts of safety critical faults found by, by Boscombe Down in, in that code that's why Boscombe Down keeps wanting to see the source language code for new aircraft that are, that are delivered, that are, that are bought in from the states or somewhere and that's why they fight tooth and nail to get the opportunity to, re- to review the software on which your lives depend if you're, if you're actually flying in these, uh, in these aircraft. Because the development... You know, this, this is not... I'm not, not saying that, that Boeing are no good at developing software or by comparison with other developers. What I'm saying is that the development techniques that we routinely use, and in particular the certification regimes that we routinely use, are broken. They don't do the job. Otherwise, you wouldn't get this sort of stuff through the most rigorous levels of, uh, of certification that we know about. Why don't companies adopt better methods? This is a quote from Sir Tony Hoare. He used to be prof at Oxford. When he retired from there, he went to Microsoft Research in Cambridge, which is where he is at the moment. And he compares the state of the industry with, with what medicine was like back in the days of the barber surgeons when you, you needed a, a leg amputated, you, uh, you went to the barber because he was the guy with the sharp knives. And as he says, the industry doesn't like being told that what they need is, to, is a radical change, that, that they need to learn about a lot of science and that they then need to carry out their processes in a way that is going to avoid the bugs and the the difficulties that would otherwise arise. Every engineering discipline goes through these transitions. We have to accelerate the process for software engineering because it's such an important industry. We can't wait 2,000 years to learn how to do stuff properly, as as the civil engineers did. We can't, can't afford to wait 200 years, as the medics did. Somehow we need to accelerate the process because we are too dependent on on this sort of logic, and we, we need to be building it right. As I said, testing can't be the answer. There are too many paths. The good news is that most of the costs come out of error detection and correction. So if you develop your software right, not only do you take the bugs out, you take most of the costs out as well. So unusually, there's a double win here. 
the, the very things that you want to do to improve quality also take risks out of the development project and costs out of the lifetime of the software. Because what you're doing is avoiding the errors and omissions, detecting errors early before they're growing in cost. So you do what other engineers do. You, you, you create your precise high-level descriptions and gradually add detail showing that, that you're preserving the, the things, the, the properties that you need. How do you get the right technical solution? Use an architect. It's what other engineers do in, in a similar situation. Bring in an expert to help you to get the specification right. And having helped you to get the specification right, they then come round to your side of the table and help you to manage the procurement, manage the project just as an architect would, taking responsibility end to end, you know, some, some level of accountability for the success of the overall project. Architects typically get paid a percentage of the total development costs, and that's, that's the way that they, that they work. Uh, they, have a, they have a stake in the, in the success of the, uh, of the project all the way through, so you'd want to incentivize them to make it more expensive, but my guess is that the building trade has found a solution to that. Having got your formal spec, you can go through a, a correct by construction development phase that goes through formal specification, formal design, then a high level sort of annotated code, and then an implementation in a, in a strong language like Spark, the, uh, the Spark Ada subset. Bringing in security properties and strengthening it, it all with proofs and proofs that the steps that you're taking in doing the design at each step are in fact correct. The guiding principles of correct by construction are, are these. The sound bite, right, right, says when you're writing stuff down, do it unambiguously, accurately, using notations that have a strong semantics, a strong formal definition of what they mean. And then make progress in, in baby steps. Tiny, tiny incremental steps. The smaller the step that you take, the easier it is to show that it's correct. And so making lots and lots and lots of very small refinement steps from, from your specification through to your code um, makes it much easier to, to carry out the checking, much faster. You find the errors much more quickly. Unless you can successfully partition your system... Um, if you can decompose it into modules that have very simple interfaces between them, then you can afford to run parallel teams. If it is highly integrated, then you just need to be taking those steps sequentially. Writing stuff in one place stops you saying it inconsistently in more than one, one place. This is key to correct by construction. Don't move on until you've verified what you've done before. The way that the, the Praxis team always said, uh, in fact, um, P Peter Amy, who was uh, very much the, the prime mover in this, check here before going there. Do the validation that, that where you are is completely sound before moving on. And document what you're doing. Argue your corner. Explain every design decision you've taken. Firstly, because it will help you to realize that actually it was wrong. Um, in writing down a clear justification for a decision you've just taken, you will quite often find that it's wrong. And secondly, because you can just about guarantee that if you haven't documented it, you won't be able to remember when you come back to it why you did it that way and not the other way, which suddenly looks much more obvious, but which the first time round you realise didn't work for some important reason. Use the right tools. If it's a screw, use a screwdriver. If, if you've got particular verification objectives, use the right form of verification. You know, if, if what you want to do is to verify whether your understanding of the application domain is right, then you need to interview experts. If the, the step that you want to, to check is whether this design really has the properties of that higher level design, then a formal proof is the way to do it, supported by strong tools and so on. Some things you'll need to test if, if you, you don't know how the real world behaves under certain circumstances or you can't get a definition of what, what this hardware interface is from the manufacturers. You may just have to test it. It may be the best that you can do to get that information. And think. 
I mean, most of the, the reason for having strong processes in engineering is to free people up from wasting brain cycles on trivia, reinventing the standard document format over and over and over again, when what they ought to be doing is using those brain cycles to solve problems that nobody's ever solved before. Getting people to focus on the hard issues and really use their brains is, is fundamental to doing good engineering. This is interesting. This is the sort of thing that you end up with if you're, if you're implementing in Spark, in the Spark Ada subset. What you do is you, you write your module specifications independently of writing the code in Spark. So the, the package definitions um, contain these structured comments. The double minus is standard Ada comment. The hash sign tells the Spark examiner, that this is a particular comment. This contains something that it, it will be able to understand. And what you're doing is telling the tools that are going to analyze this information about the data, whether a particular parameter that, that is, you know, a particular variable is going to only be read or only be written to, or whether it's going to be read and written to, in order that you can do a proper data flow analysis and saying what the post condition is. What, what will the situation be after this procedure has been executed? I mean, that's just a trivial procedure at the top there, defined as something which will zero the trip counter on, a, on an odometer. And so, of course, the post condition is that the, the trip value is now zero. And so you have a, a specification like this, um, and then when you write the code... The tools check that the code really does meet all those criteria. And if it doesn't, it tells you about it straight away. So the moment you make a programming error that violates the things you've said have to be true, you get told about it by the tool set. This was a, an experiment carried out by the National Security Agency to look at the correct by construction approach. They wanted to know whether it would work, essentially. This is a presentation that, that Randy Johnson of the NSA gave. The team was the, the biometric people from, uh, from the NSA. Praxis, long after I'd uh, stopped having anything to do with the company, Praxis were the developers. The testing was done independently by the NSA's standard um, testing consultants in Albuquerque, and they wanted to know whether the methodology could be taught easily to people who didn't have any background in it. So they took three student interns over the summer and got practice to train them for a week in the methodology to see whether, in fact, they could then apply it and, and extend the software. The basic notion is that you've got a, a protected enclave. You've got a room which has a, a gate, a door. Being the NSA, it's called an enclave and a portal, but it's a room with a door. And it's got a, a reader sitting outside that has a display. Uh, you put a, a token into it, you know, a pass of some sort, and you stick your fingerprint on it. And it checks the pass, it reads your fingerprint, and it decides whether to open the door. Uh, and inside, there's, there's a, a, a bloke with a gun who's uh, capable of sorting things out if you try to get in some other way. The system came out as, uh, as about 10,000 lines of, of ADA, plus about another 4,000 lines of, of support software that they wrote. But the, uh, the, the main core functional software was, was ADA. And this is the productivity. 38 lines of code a day, calculated over the entire project duration, dividing the total number of lines of code by the total number of, of days that were spent on the entire project. This is the highest productivity that the NSA has ever seen on any project of any sort carried out in, in any way. In other words, the correct by construction process that was taken was the cheapest way of developing software that the NSA had ever seen. Note that the programmers are also writing the Spark annotations. And they wrote 16,000 lines of Spark annotations free as part of that project. We're not counting those in the lines of code. And that's the basic metrics. The guys in Albuquerque couldn't find any faults. They tested it for three months. The only fault that they found was a defect in a, in a user guide, which the practice team had written as a freebie because they thought it might be helpful to the, uh, to the testers if they had a user guide. It wasn't part of the contract, which in the circumstances was a bit mean to complain, wasn't it? And these are what Randy Johnson's conclusions were, that the development process met the common criteria for, for EAL 5 plus, for, for the uh, evaluation assurance level 5. Um, in fact... I mean, it's, it's an EAL7 development process. It's, uh, it's the most stringent in the common criteria. 
and it's, it's quick and reliable and fast and commercially supported by a number of different uh, organizations. And then they, they trained the, uh, the interns and it turned out that they could modify the system uh, with equal success over the summer. They didn't introduce any errors in the process. They did more than they were asked to do in the, in the two months that they had over the summer. They, they implemented some stuff that, uh, that wasn't part of their requirements. And so the, the NSA ended up saying, it's proven and practical in our judgment. So my conclusions, what have I been saying? That we must reduce the risk in the projects. They are in danger of being out of control and in many cases are already out of control and we can't afford that. Firstly, because of the financial cost and secondly, because of the operational impact. We simply can no longer guarantee that operational systems will be in service on the dates when they're needed for critical applications because of the complexity of the software developments and the fact we're not doing them right. And we must greatly improve the dependability of software-based systems. We must build systems that have fewer defects, particularly security defects, because we're facing much more aggressive adversaries. Pe people are going looking for trouble. It's not just the schoolboy hackers in their bedroom breaking into systems now. It's organized crime, and in one or two cases recently, it looks as though it's actually other states that have been exploiting these techniques. So it, it is a critical issue. Something needs to be done. And there is a solution. And the solution is this two-phase procurement that I've been advocating, which has also been recommended in a report by the Royal Academy of Engineering on complex systems, published about two years ago. Uh, and you'll find that on the Royal Academy's website. It's been advocated in the report from the National Academy of Sciences on building certifiably dependable software. Uh, and that's available from the National Academy's press. In other words, what we need to do is to become proper engineers. We need to force the industry to become proper engineers, and it has to be customer-led. If the market doesn't demand it, there is no reason why the suppliers will ever change from what they're doing at the moment. Martin Thomas was asked four questions. Question one. When analysing systems, is it good practice to use different tools depending on the properties you want to analyse. Absolutely. It's part of the mantra about using the right tools for the, for the job. If you want to understand the, the behaviour of a system as a finite state machine, then express it as a finite state machine and analyse it. There are lots of good tools. If it's a concurrent system and you need to really understand the concurrent behaviour, then you're going to need to use a, a specification technique that, you know, like the pi calculus or... Or, or something which gives you the ability to analyze the, the concurrent behavior. If it's a, a protocol, then there are some very good methods and supporting tools from the people at Oxford University, from, from Bill Roscoe and his team, that give you the ability to analyze those things. And a good engineer will use whatever set of formalisms is appropriate. The scientists will say, what about the stuff that falls down the gaps? You know, at a theoretical level, the underlying logics are not properly integrated. And the engineer says, look, I'm trying to do a job here, and this is giving me really powerful insight into aspects of it. You solve the theoretical problems, I'm going to use the best tools I've got available. Question two. If you can't write completely error-free software, is the other approach to use fault-tolerance software? It's worth developing resilient software, particularly because the hardware will always misbehave. You get, you know, single event upsets being caused, particularly in stuff flying at altitude, where as the feature size on the electronics gets smaller and smaller, the damage that can be caused by, by single particle radiation is, is actually getting more and more and more serious. And so you can't rely on the fact that the processors are really going to do what, what you want or that the data stays the way that you set it. You know, you write one into a field and it turns into, into zero or in, into three. So you, you do need to program around the things that could go wrong in the hardware. Uh, and, of course, hardware fails more dramatically. You know, processes fail, components burn out, and so on. And so your, your software architecture needs to, to take account of the overall fault-tolerant architecture that has been developed from a proper systems engineering view of the complete system. But I, I haven't been talking about the systems engineering level today because I wanted to talk about the software. Question three. 
Do you think that existing software should be treated as a lesson learned, and that we should just start from scratch? Um, yes, I, I think that we can't afford to be held back by the legacy that we've got, and that progressively we need a, a strategy for replacing the stuff that's already there with stuff that's more dependable. We can't afford a, the kind of situation that we've got with things like NAS, the, the National Airspace System, where you know they've been propping up the hardware to avoid rewriting the software. They've been getting bits of hardware out of the science museum. You can certainly redevelop from the designs, and there may even be bits of the software that are not particularly critical and where you can tolerate the fact that they, it may have properties that you, you don't necessarily know. Quite often, for example, di display handling software, the chances of a library of software that is, is just handling the screen for you, chances of it putting up something which is corrupt but plausibly misleading, you know, changing a, a displayed picture into another displayed picture that is wrong but looks like a real picture, chance of that happening is vanishingly small. So typically you don't have to worry about it. If the software is written to work at the bit level, then its chances of coming up with a plausible abstraction wrongly is sufficiently low as to be ignorable. But if it's working at the abstraction level by displaying, a, you know, out of a, a library of plausible images, then it could display the wrong plausible image. So you, you do have to do the analysis, but quite often there will be components that are not critical. Question four. With reference to CMM, what's your opinion of mature organisations such as Boeing and the quality of their deliverables. Firstly, I'm, I'm a fan of the CMM and of ISO 9000. Um, I, I did mention at one point the importance of strong engineering processes, and, uh, and that's what I regard them as. You know, that's just basic hygiene. If, if you're not approximately level three on the CMM, you're not going to be able to introduce formal methods because you're not going to be able to introduce any sustainable change. Because, you know, that's the definition of level three on the CMM. If you're not there, then you can't guarantee to be able to roll something out and have it take in the organization. So it, it is important to bring about improvement in any, in any organization in a, in a measured way. And uh, Rob can, can tell you more war stories than I can about introducing CMM into large organizations. Boeing are very good. They're serious professionals. They're, they're people who take safety extremely seriously, who work very hard in order to develop stuff, but they're working under constraints. Some bits of Boeing sometimes use formal methods and spark and develop bits of code that way, but they haven't taken the decision that they will adopt it right throughout the organization because they haven't seen the commercial drivers to do so. It may be that changes in certification requirements by the FAA will in due course lead them to find a commercial benefit for doing that. Mr Thomas can be contacted by email at martin, spelt Mike Alpha Romeo Tango Yankee November, at thomas-associates.co.uk. Please note that the views expressed in this presentation are entirely and solely those of the presenter and do not necessarily reflect official thinking and policy of either Her Majesty's Government or the Ministry of Defence.